Lord Hastings, it's a pleasure to have you with us here. Thank you very much. Uh, at SIG TV and in the Cayman Islands. Uh, so you're known worldwide as a crusader for good corporate citizenship. Why is that? Because I'm absolutely passionate about the power of business to lead change in the societies it works in. Business used to be or traditionally was seen as purely about profit making and extraction. What we take from society was the old fashioned mode. The new mode is very much that business is a partner in the creation of society, that it's an active player in the positive development of every society's needs. Businesses are passionate about educational development, they're passionate about community issues, they're passionate about disability, they're very passionate about the environment and therefore what I want to encourage is businesses to step up to the plate, take their role seriously and become leaders and advocates. Wow, so what elements really make the way for companies to become good corporate citizens? It starts with the chief executive, the chairman, the leader. It starts with their decision to recognize that being a significant person in a community, in a society, means you have a role. You have a place where you can lead change. You can actually advocate things. People listen to you. You click your fingers, they gather. You can influence things with government. You can influence things with your fellow business colleagues. You can make real change happen. So are companies who consider themselves good corporate citizens, you, you say, are they really doing what is, what is required in what we call a rapidly changing global environment? Well, I think the wake-up calls have been quite prominent in the course of the last, say, eight, eight to ten years. We've had the global financial crisis, which caused a lot of the financial institutions to ask deep questions about what were they really doing? What was their purpose in society? Who was affected by their irresponsible behaviors? We've had many natural disasters which caused businesses like Walmart classically to ask the question, oh my goodness me, sustainability issues affect the way we operate. Many other businesses in the tech sector asking, wow, we really impact the way people behave, mm -hmm. the things that they do in their social lives as well as they do in their professional lives. So therefore, what is our responsibility to protect them and to ensure that information is secure, but also to educate at the same time? How do we use the technological revolution to educate people to be more progressive and to be more well-informed and therefore to step forward in the opportunities in front of them? So I think this mode change, mm -hmm. the issues between new technology and the power of, of social media, the crises that we face in the financial sector, and the reality that the natural environment is at risk. All of these have driven the changing emphasis in business. Government is forced, as we know, to change their approach in the way that they do business. Uh, should corporate, corporate Cayman be expected to do the same? Well, every government has got to be responsive to the people's needs, otherwise it doesn't have a very long life, <laughs> unless it becomes some kind of control mechanism. So government must respond to the way in which public emphasis is moving. That doesn't mean to say it should be dictated by public trends, but it does mean to say it should provide leadership that the public wish to aspire to and to follow. And I do think the emphasis that, that the public are increasingly putting all over the world is there is a duty to sustainability. There is a duty to protect the natural environment. There is a duty and a responsibility to reduce waste and to reduce carbon. There is a duty to ensure the next generation are well educated, have good prospects, have secure and well supported foundations for the way in which they learn and their prospects beyond school. And there is a duty to ensure jobs, that we don't have displaced young men and women who become disturbed or violent or, or just inconsistent with the rest of society because they don't have meaningful work. Now those are duties that fall on government but they also fall on business at the same time and I do think the model that we're looking at into the future is not one of government or business or, si or the public sector or NGOs, mm -hmm. but of a new civil society where they're all working hand in glove to build the best kind of constructive communities for all the people involved. I'm going to go off track a bit here. Are there any countries around the globe that you're, you're in the market, KPMG's in that particular market, that you think are doing it more right than others? Any that stand out to you in that area? Well, we're in 156 countries around the world, 162,000 people in KPMG, just for a piece of information. Right. Um, where are we working it, that we see this kind of more constructive, holistic society? Well, any independent studies that ask where is prosperity in the widest sense of the word best felt? Now, what that means is not just income, but prosperity is about how you feel safe in your community. Can you walk around at night? Do you have good social relationships? Does the justice 
system work for you? Is the natural environment well protected? Do you have sound uh, education in your community? Does the electricity supply work? I mean, these are fundamentals about ordinary life. And when you ask which countries are really getting that right, mm -hmm. every independent survey from the World Economic Forum to a multitude of others comes out with a Nordic four. So you tend to get you know, Norway, Sweden, Finland, Denmark. Those are the countries who always come top of the pile. Then you sort of go Canada, Australia, New Zealand. Then you start to head down the list. I mean, the United States and the UK are sort of within, within the top 10 to 15. But you're really, now, what is the critical difference about those Nordic countries? And it is that they have a comprehensive social solution as well as sound economic policy. They're vibrant economies, they're manufacturing, they grow, their growth rates are stable, their banking systems are strong, mm -hmm. but they also have a real commitment to social welfare, and those things are driven by fair policies. And I think that is the right mix for the societies of the future. We're, we're watching a lot of paralysis in big economies at the moment, mm -hmm. a certain country not too far north from here, which just can't make decisions about how to ensure that they pay debt in a responsible way. You know, we don't want to see that paralysis sweep across the rest of the world. We've seen too much of it in Europe at the moment, and it destroys jobs and it destroys futures. So for governments to work hand in hand with business is the most constructive way to make sure we serve society well. Let's bring it back locally. Would you say uh, from the picture that you see here in, in, in Cayman that there are enough uh, corporate, good corporate citizens? Well, this is, this is a wonderful country in its own right because it, it, is, it is a small community mm -hmm. on a beautiful island in a fantastic setting in the Caribbean, but with risks, as there were just a couple of years ago around hurricanes. There are risks from the environment. There are also risks about the next generation, about their educational skills and potential. There are risks about making sure that resources are applied rightly, justly, and fairly for the growth of this community into the long term. So this is, this is a place in which for every corporation, because it is essentially, uh, in, this is a town in, in an English sense of the word, so everybody here could work better together. And what that needs is a combination of business leadership, government leadership, and public institutions to stop separating themselves into different categories and setting out their priorities distinctly. They need to work hand in glove. Now, the one party to this, which is usually the most resistant, our government. And the reason for that is some kind of sense of elevated difference. That's not an appropriate way to lead and govern in the modern world. It's really important to take everybody in the community hand in hand with what's going to be the right thing for the next generation. You mentioned crime uh, earlier, which is very interesting because crime and, and social ills uh, are growing uh, in here in Cayman in particular. Can companies become good corporate citizens by fighting crime? Uh, together, uh, can they not just to protect their bottom line, of course, but to protect everybody uh, on the islands? Well, you, you always have to ask the question, where is the crime coming from? W what is the root of this dislocation of mm -hmm. people, or people feeling that they need to assault other people? For what purpose? Where is it really coming from? Now, and you know, There are easy answers to it, like, well, it's driven by drugs, or it's driven by alcohol, or it's driven by family pressures. But sometimes there are also more significant economic answers to that, such as people don't have meaningful work, or they feel displaced within a wealthier society, or they don't have the skills to function in the kind of economy that's coming about in the future. So the role of business, therefore, is to ask itself, how can we make sure the skill levels of every 16-year-old in our country is up to a par where they could compete in the global market? and they could compete here at home. That means backing and supporting educational initiatives driven between government and business hand in hand. Mm -hmm. It also means asking the tough questions about family structure. If there are children who are outside of supportive family relationships, what kind of mentoring and support can businesses provide that might back up mothers or fathers who are on their own? What kind of support can businesses provide people who, after the school period, don't have a place to go? such as and waiting for a parent to come home. Those kind of difficulties which all cause emotional tensions as much as the learning tensions. And that's where, again, I think the partnership between the public sector and the private sector could find real solutions. How does a company, a, co a corporation, really, that may not be global but may be local, mm. uh, go about building and becoming good corporate citizens? Well, it, it starts by asking what are the five obvious needs in the immediate community around us that are not significantly being addressed and what role could we play 
in addressing some of that need. And it could be that the company starts with saying, well, what we're going to do is advocate the cause. So we're going to promote the issue, we're going to market the issue, and we're going to make a fuss. That's one way of doing it. Mm -hmm. Another way of doing it is saying, well, let's tackle one of these pressure points, gather our people, whether there's 10 people, 5, 15 people, 25 people, 2,000 people in the organization, gather them to make a difference. Do we make a difference on a couple of days? Do we make a difference twice a month? Do we make a difference consistently over the year? We can, we can be involved in some of those community development needs. But thirdly, what comes out of that is how can we get other businesses to stand together in a common fashion to provide common resources to address significant unresolved needs. And that, that all comes down to leadership. It comes down to the leadership that a business man or woman has over their organization, no matter how big the organization is, but simply human compassion to say, these are unresolved needs, unmet priorities, let's put our hand into this, get it moving, because that's our opportunity. Mm -hmm. In a small society like Cayman, it's typically who you know, who knows you. And we, we often tend to go about doing business in, in that fashion. Oh, I know someone over at KPMG. Mm. Let me give them a call, mm. see if they're interested in supporting this. That aside, what would you say to governments out there and government leaders who really need to think outside the box and, and the way that they approach companies mm. and corporations and giving them or giving them, having them buy in to the idea of becoming good corporate citizens? Mm. What, what, what do they do, really? Where, where does it all start with the government mm. being able to approach corporations? Well, for the way you describe the, the question, you've got a great advantage here because you are a relatively tight community, so people do know each other. So there is confidence in the community. Actually, you would rate very, very highly on all the scores of well-being which is actually a great advantage. People feel relatively safe here. They feel a sense of connection and community. That's a strong asset. So it means that instead of having a com or communities that are, are too distant from each other, where people are very dislocated, you've got a greater sense of harmony and common partnership. I think, I think the, role, the role of government with the private sector is to start an honest, open dialogue. Let's pick, pick four or five issues that are just kind of sore points, things that are not adequately resolved. Pick those issues. I mean, such as, for example, the performance of 14 to 16 year olds at school is a really complex need issue. It needs addressing. It's not just a resource question, not just about teachers, it's not just about money, it's about time to develop the skills base of the next generation. So how can business and government do that together? By squaring out, mapping out the pressure points, mapping out the individual schools where things are not quite right, asking could there be some mentorship for that head teacher? Could be there some mentorship for individual teachers? Could there be people from business going in to read in schools or supporting the maths program? Could there be some new physical buildings and resources that are needed between government and the private sector? We've seen fascinating models of this in the UK where you get businesses like, such as KPMG in the UK putting in millions of pounds to build schools in parts of London with the government in order to empower a different way of learning, different approaches which are proving hugely successful in terms of results. So there are different mechanisms to achieving these outcomes and it starts with an honesty dialogue and it also starts with no presupposition that either business or government is in the lead. But we have to do this for the service of the public and I sense that when I've talked to the business people I've met here in the course of the last couple of days. They do have that. We want to be partners. We want to be willing participants. We want to be involved in the development of the social structure and the stability of this community into the long term. This is a precious asset that you've got here in the Cayman Islands and it should never be allowed to be eroded simply because two sides will not actually put down their muskets and face each other with a common drink together. Let's talk a little bit about KPMG for our viewers out there who may not be aware of the company and this global uh, you know, uh, entity. What areas really interest the company on a, on a, on a global level, but as far as uh, being good corporate citizens? Well, what are your areas of interest? And then let's, let's go further and say uh, what areas really interest you uh, across the globe, but in, in, in the local environments? How do you decide what you're going to do? How, how are you going to become a, a corporate citizen in any particular uh, mm. um, a country? Let's take Cayman, for instance. Mm. Well, let me start with the global first of all. As, as I said a few answers ago, we've got 162,000 people in this organization in 156 countries. There's a lot of people to motivate, mm -hmm. a lot of people to move. But if we could get the power of that 162,000 all uh, engineered towards some common objectives, then we really are quite a powerful force. And one of those common objectives that we've made a strident 
public commitment to is to international development. We've recognized that most of our people, almost without exception, are very privileged individuals. No matter where they are in the organization, from the assistants, at, as you might say, at the bottom of the power to the partners at the top, everybody here is uniquely privileged in this organization. They're reasonably well paid, they're doing good professional jobs, they have exciting times during their day, they've got good prospective careers, they move around the world, they're well educated. So take that privilege and empower it, direct it towards the corners of the world, which are still immensely under pressure. Multitudes in Latin America and even here in the Caribbean, multitudes great across the great continent of Africa and Southeast Asia, where communities still don't have fundamental electricity. They don't have running water systems. They don't have pharmaceuticals and, and, and good medical care. They don't have good educational facilities. And for far too many of them, particularly the, uh, particularly the 16 to 20 age group, this enormous, enormous bubble of youth unemployment all over over the world, which means young men and women with nothing to do, day in, day out, year in, year out. And of course, that is to stoke up trouble. Now, what can we do in the light of all of that? We can get involved in partnerships with major NGOs, which we have done, such as World Vision, Save the Children, UNICEF. We've got these major global partnerships. We directly use our facilities, our cash, and our skills. And, and fundamental to our program in KPMG is not just that we're a check writer so that an organization can run away with so many dollars, but rather we want to use the time and the talents and the skills of our people to help all other organizations be more effective and efficient, deliver their services better. We get directly involved in critical communities where the pressures are very immense and bring to bear many, many of our people from all over the world to focus on solving specific problems. And what we also do in addition to that is we begin to take an increasing amount of advocacy, working with the UN organizations, working with governments, working on pressure points in society. We're not afraid to have a loud voice and we're increasingly going to use it. What can more corporations, you think, in your opinion, do uh, locally to affect change? Buddy together. Have time together. If I had to take the model of what's happened in the United Kingdom, we've got two parallel organizations, one called the CBI, the Confederation of British Industry, and the other one called Business in the Community. Both organizations have parallel bosses. Many of the board members of the CBI are board members of Business in the Community. What's the difference between the two? The CBI is primarily about the power of the British economy, and the Business in the Community is mainly about the role of business in developing the communities it works and serves in. But what they've begun to do is to operate in tandem with each other. They're saying, actually, the stability of the country and the, and the routes towards a stronger economy economy also lie in a fairer, more just society. So that means you have to ally those two partnerships together, get the best out of business. I don't know what common arrangement organizations you have for business in the Cayman Islands, but if you do have them, what they should do is spend a lot less time playing golf and drinking uh, whatever they drink, but spend a lot more time instead thinking about how to solve the problems that are out there in the community. Any final thoughts? My final thoughts are when you live in a paradise, like this, you can look out onto the world and you can say, wow, if we could help the world to feel a little bit of the joy that we experience day in, day out, not just the sunshine, but the sense of ease and community partnership, not just the fact that you can freely move around with, with marginal crime by comparison, but the sense that you have economic privilege, how can you share that with the rest of the world? And I've watched KPMG here really deliver its commitment into the, into the developing world with seriousness and compassion. I'm very proud of what they do. Lord Hastings, it's been a pleasure. Thank you.